Communication. It's something most of us take for granted. From a smile and a laugh to an angry tone or a stormy look. We'll use our faces, our voices, and our actions to communicate what we feel to others. For those with Alzheimer disease, the battle to communicate, to understand and be understood, becomes more and more difficult as the disease progresses. A person with Alzheimer will have more and more problems contributing to conversations or finding the right words to express what they want to say. Eventually, when the disease is very advanced, they may be unable to speak. They may seem unresponsive to what's going on around them. As a home support worker, the progression of Alzheimer disease can also make it more difficult for you to communicate with your client. Difficult, however, does not mean impossible. So often in communication, it's not what is said, but the actions that are used that send the most powerful message. In this module, we'll look at different techniques, both verbal and nonverbal, that you as a home support worker can use in your day-to-day -day activities with Alzheimer clients. Let's watch as three actors demonstrate some of these key strategies. As you know, this part of the Alzheimer training program is on communicating. Something we do every day as actors. <laughs> and something most of us don't think a lot about. I talk to you, Lisa, and hopefully you understand what I'm saying and respond. That's right, but communication is not always that simple. Sometimes it's verbal, but often it's the nonverbal communication, the tone you use or the gestures you make that send the message. As you know, Alzheimer's disease has serious effects on the process of communicating because it breaks down language abilities, leaving the person less and less able to be understood and understand. In this module, we want to address some of the roadblocks you've told us that you face when working with Alzheimer clients. And we're going to show you some techniques and strategies we've learned about from people who study Alzheimer's disease and communication. Well, let's get started. Here's the situation. Uh, Joanne, you're the Alzheimer client, and Lisa, you're the home support worker. Now, this is your third visit to see Joanne, but you're not happy with the progress you're making. Right, because she's just not responding to me. But I'm ready to try again. Okay, good. I'll be the coach on this one. Good morning, Joanne. How are you? Move around slowly to the front. Give her a chance to see you coming. How are you, Joanne? Lisa, she has Alzheimer's disease, not a hearing problem. Now watch your body language. Make it friendly. That's great. And touch is one of the simplest and most effective ways to communicate an idea. Would you like to go outside with me for a walk? Why would I go with you? I've never seen you before in my life. Reassure her. Tell her who you are and what you're doing here. I'm Lisa. I come here every week to help out, Joanne. I was here last week. Don't you remember? How do you know my name? Why can't I remember anything? Don't question her ability to remember you. It only makes her feel anxious and embarrassed. Instead, try and find some other way to indicate that you have met before. I know. Why don't we put some fresh water into the flowers we picked last week? I remember in my garden. That's great. You see, now she's associating you with a specific activity. This helps to reassure her that you're someone safe to be with. That's right. Why don't we go to the garden and add to them? I'll get my coat. How was that? Good. I liked it. Instead of coaching me to remember her, which I wasn't able to do, she used a non-threatening, comfortable way of assuring me that we had met before. Okay, let's try another one. Mark, this time, why don't you be the home support worker, I'll be the client with Alzheimer, and Joanne, you get to coach. Okay. Lisa, what would you like for lunch? Lisa, lunch, what would you like? You've got competition. That's better. Lisa will find it much easier to concentrate on what you're saying if she can see you. Plus, by turning the TV down, you're eliminating the distraction that's hampering your communication effort. Lisa, what would you like for lunch? Lunch? It's good. Always try to maintain eye contact when you're talking. She might be finding your question confusing because it's too general. Try limiting her choices to just one or two things, or asking her a question she can answer a simple yes or no to. Lisa, would you like a tuna sandwich for lunch? 
Uh, Lisa, would you like a tuna sandwich? Give her time. Don't make her feel like she's under pressure to answer. That would be nice. Okay, well, why don't you turn off the TV and go wash up your hands and I'll finish making lunch. Don't set yourself or your client up for a situation that is bound to fail because you've given them too many instructions. Break the tasks down into smaller sections and provide clear, slow instructions. Lisa, let's turn the TV off. Great. Come on. Now, why don't we wash your hands? All right. Good. There were a couple of things we did there that improved the communication. We eliminated any possible distractions. I spoke slowly and clearly, concentrating on questions that could be answered yes or no to. And by giving Lisa one task at a time, you were able to avoid confusing her. One of the most valuable things you can do for your Alzheimer clients is to allow them the opportunity to express themselves in ways that they feel comfortable with. Let's show you another example. Mark, Joanne. Joanne, would you like to help me with the dishes? All right, but you'll need the drapes. Joanne, why would I need drapes to do the dishes? You have to use the drapes. They get the dishes clean. I, I don't know what you mean, Joanne. Okay, look for some hints, signs, anything that might let you know what she wants. Uh, do you mean this? Uh, the dish, dish soap? No, the square thing. Square thing. Uh, oh, the, this, the dish towel? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll wash and you dry. But I'm not wet. People with Alzheimer's disease tend to make exact interpretations of the things they hear. So be very specific. I know I mean you dry the dishes with the dish towel. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. The dishes go in a press, but I'm not sure which one. The press? The dishes always go in the press, but I'm not sure which press they go in. Can you, uh, can you show me what you mean? Oh, the cupboard. Yes, <laughs> the press. Oh, okay. Joanne's background is British. They often call a cupboard a press. And while she may not have used the word press in years, the effects of the disease have brought that word to the surface. It helps if you know something of the person's background. It's not always going to be possible to understand references to something from another country, cultural or religious background, but look for ways of helping your client express himself whenever you can. Okay, last one. What do you do in a situation where the disease is becoming more advanced and communication is becoming increasingly difficult? In cases where your client is less able to make himself understood or understand what's being said to him, use body language, touch, and as many other aids as possible in your conversation to keep communication going. Let's show you what we mean. Hello, Mark. I'm Lisa, and I've come to visit with you. There's nothing there anymore. Blackness. It's all right. Look, it's a beautiful day outside. Blackness. Dark, dark, dark. Who did you say you were again? M my daughter? No, I'm Lisa, a friend, and I've come to visit with you. Well, where's my daughter? She's not here. She's at work, and she's asked me to come and see you. I don't know anyone anymore. Well, then why don't we have a look at your photo album? Right here. It's got lots of pictures of your daughter and your grandchildren. Do I have dogs? I always like dogs. No, but... You have three beautiful grandchildren. This is Jonathan, this is Stephanie, and this is Emily. You must think I'm crazy. No, I think you have three beautiful grandchildren. 
Would you like to write their names in underneath their pictures? Okay. All oh, right. There. This is Jonathan. John, Jonathan. Stephanie. Stephanie. And Emily. Emily. There. See? They're on a swing. Huh. What are their names? Jonathan. Jonathan. Stephanie. Stephanie and Emily. Emily. All right. What we've shown you here are some of the verbal and nonverbal skills you can use to overcome communication roadblocks with your Alzheimer clients. Depending on the person, communication tools like signs and labels may help you get your message across. And nonverbal communication like gestures, smiling, and touching can provide a lot of comfort to someone with Alzheimer's disease. It's important to remember that not every client will respond identically to the methods we've shown here. That's right. For example, some clients don't like to be touched, so a heavy emphasis on physical contact wouldn't be appropriate. However, as a home support worker, you need to make your communication efforts both positive and supporting. It can make a big difference to you and your client. For a person with Alzheimer's disease, sometimes the only way to communicate that is left is through behavior or body language. Instead of relying only on your verbal skills, use all of your senses to communicate, including sight, sound, and touch. Our words, our eyes, our whole bodies send very definite messages. Whatever way you communicate, make it clear, make it reassuring and comforting, and most importantly, make it caring.